you have your Bibles, Galatians chapter 5, and I'm going to try not to preach very long today. I know, here's the problem, every time I say that, I end up preaching kind of long, and I've tried to shorten it a little bit this morning because we have a great meal um, uh, planned for you today after service, carry and lunch. We, we are, ch- are a church that likes to eat together. Um, we do that pretty good, and, and um, we have fried chicken coming. Anybody like fried chicken? I, I like me some good fried chicken, but um, Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> We are in a series this morning that we've been in for a few weeks called The Fruit of the Spirit. And if you haven't been around, that graphic that's on the screen, I'm actually looking at it, it's on the back wall, but it's, it's a lot bigger right there, um, was one that my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter drew for her mom and just kind of randomly drew it. And I saw it, and I said, man, I believe that's what our next sermon series is going to be. And so... Um, I know it's not spelled properly and everything like that, but that's okay, right? That's her interpretation of the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, so we've been in this series called The Fruit of the Spirit. And so it's, I I keep saying this, and I'm going to say it every week just so we get it. It's one fruit. One bowl, right? One fruit bowl. One, he said, but the fruit of the Spirit with nine. So that's one bowl right there. Nine different flavors, if you will. It's kind of like a bag of Skittles, right? It's one bag of Skittles, right? Or I'm a chocolate guy. One bag of M&Ms, right? But different colors. I have a big old thing of M&Ms on my office desk. It started out really big, and it's been there for two weeks, and it's almost empty. So if anybody has the gift of acquiring M&Ms... I'm going to have to go to Sam's and get me another big, big one. But, so it's one fruit, right, with a few different flavors, nine actually. And it's the fruit of the, where does it come from? All right, let's say that together. It's the fruit of the, so it comes from the, from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, right? And it's different from the gifts, plural, gifts uh, of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit. It's different. The fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. That was, that was week number two, actually, because God's called us to what? Live a radical life of love. That's one of our core values here, to love big. Because God loved us in a huge way that, that while we were yet sinners, the Bible says that Christ, what? Died for us, right? Radical love. And then last week we talked about this idea but the fruit of the spirit is love and joy anybody have a chance to put this message from last week into practice because remember we said we said joy it's not based on what happens around you because a lot of stuff can happen around you that can take your joy right even today we're going to talk about things that can take your peace so you guys know i love walmart i share that all the time that's my battle man it's my struggle But can I tell you that Wednesday afternoon, I left this church office because we had to go buy food for the football team that we were going to feed on Friday. And so we were debating whether we want to go to Sam's up to Tosser, whether we can do it here. And so I was thinking about all the different grocery stores in this town that I could go to without going to Walmart. And then I got to thinking, well, if I go to this one then I'm probably not going to be able to get this in a bigger package. I, I, I can just get some small things of noodles. So I'm going to have to just take one for the team, and I'm going to have to suck it up and put my big boy pants on, and I'm going to have to go to Walmart. That's what I was thinking, right? But then God reminded me of the message that I just preached three days earlier. He said, boy, are you going to have joy even when you do something that you don't want to do? And that's go to Walmart. And I said, yes, God, I hear what you're saying. So I'm driving to Walmart, and I am praying. I said, Lord, you got to help me today. Because we talked last week. We said that that people can have their own opinion that can cause you to lose your joy, but it doesn't mean that you got to accept their opinion. You can ignore it. Amen? And that people can do things to you, and you don't have to receive it. When people do things to you or say things about you, you don't have to receive it. You can just shake your dust off your feet, and you can move on. So, Brother Mike, I made a decision. I was going to go to Walmart and go as fast as I can through that store and get everything. And I get to Walmart, and I look at my truck seat, and I don't have the list. 
And I thought I had the list. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. So I'm like thinking about all these things in my mind that we need. How many pounds of this and how many pounds of that? How many you know, containers of this? But can I just tell you? Now, I don't always, I'm, I'm bragging on myself. I passed the test Wednesday. I did not lose my joy in Walmart. I went to Walmart. I did my thing. I shopped. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. There's some things that happened later on in the week that I probably didn't pass the test. <laughs> but Wednesday, I passed the test, man. I got extra credit. Everything was good. Because, I, listen to me, and I say all that to say this, I made a decision that I'm not going to let somebody running over me with a cart going to steal my joy. Amen. I, I, so, you know, the price being higher than I think it should be, I'm not going to let that take my joy. And I'm not going to let it take my joy when I go to check out and there's only like two checkers open. And there's like a line. And I could go to the self-checkout, but I didn't go to the self-checkout because we're church and we had to use a tax exempt thing and you can't do that. So I, I waited in line, yes me, joyfully. And picked up a bag of M&M's on the way out. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? That, that, that don't let other people and don't let other circumstances determine the joy because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. So this morning, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. And this morning, we're going to talk about this third one, peace. Would you just be honest today? You don't have to raise your hand. Is, do, do you come in here in need of peace? We're going to talk about what peace is this morning and what we think peace is and what peace really isn't. And I just want to dig right in. Our big idea is this. Look at this. Shalom. I'll show you how much I know Hebrew. That's the Hebrew word for, for peace. Is a real good thing. You say, Pastor, that's just so simple. Well, guess what? The gospel's simple. We make the gospel too hard. We make studying scripture too hard. We say, oh, is it literal or is it, you know, something happening? No, listen. Peace in your life is a really good thing. This word shalom, you know, when someone says, if you go to Israel and they say, you know, shalom, or they say, you know, peace unto you, and then your response would be, and also with you, right? Um, listen, it, it doesn't mean I hope you don't have any troubles. Let me just stop right there. That's, we got this fictitious idea of what peace is in our life and what peace is in the church. And we think, man, you can just come to this church and you can be a part of this church because this church doesn't have any troubles or trials or frustration. Can I tell you that that's not what true peace is? Because we live in a fallen world. So guess what? They will, there will never be a perfect church. Why? Because there is only one perfect Jesus. Are you with me this morning? So as long as there's people in the church, or as long as there's people in our lives and people in culture, there's always going to be struggles. There's always going to be tension, right? And so we have to understand, and this message is all about understanding how to live with that tension. Because when I'm up here preaching about peace this morning, I'm just not saying that, that, that you just have this pie-in-the-sky experience where nothing ever happens in your life bad. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this life you're going to have trials and you're going to have tribulations. I, I got that one memorized. Because anytime something comes out, I'm like, I'm like okay, Jesus said that. But Jesus also went on to say, you can overcome. And why can you overcome? Why can you have peace in the middle of those situations? Because Jesus has already won the victory. Amen? Jesus has already won the battle. It, it, it doesn't mean that you're going to have an absence of problems or you're going to have an absence of trouble, an absence of conflict. But listen to me. True biblical peace is not based on your earthly circumstances. True biblical peace says good is coming your way in spite of those circumstances. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said to the Roman church? You know what? He says, you know, he, he, said, he said this. All things work together. You know, you know that verse? All things work together to the good. To them that what? Love God and those that are called according to his purpose. Let me just back up. He said all things work together to the good. He's not just talking about good things. 
He's not just talking about average things. He's talking about when life is down to the wire, dirty, crappy, nasty, when you are down on the mat. So one of my favorite movies, can I just tell you, and you're going to think I'm a big sinner. <laughs> the Rocky movies. Did I date myself? Anybody love the Rocky movies? And, and I just remember, and, and one of my favorite ones is when he's fighting the Russian. He is getting a mess kicked out of him, Brother Danny. Adrian! Yo! And what? This guy, he wants, his trainer wants to what? Throw in the towel and quit and give up because he thinks that the Russian is going to kill him. And he said, no, don't throw in the towel because even though that I'm getting beat up, listen, all things, I can make this spiritual, all things are going to work together in the end. Because the Italian stallion, Rocky Balboa, eventually he hawks up. That's a, that's a wrestling reference. I'm dating myself. Do you remember Hulk Hogan? Anybody? Just be honest if you like old school wrestling. I'm not talking about the old school wrestling. Hulk Hogan, like, he's getting beat up by Andre the Giant. He takes it. And he keeps taking it. I was going to bring Mike up here, and Mike can play the part of Andre the Giant, and I'll be Hulk Hogan, but he smashed me. But anyway, he takes it, and he takes it. He takes it, and all of a sudden, he just, he stops. And he says, and he, and he takes a hit. And he takes a hit. And then all of a sudden, guess what? And, and this is how, it's my grandfather's fault. He got me into wrestling on the old black and white little 13-inch TV. And all of a sudden, this is what he does to the giant. He blocks the punch, and he hits. Remember this? And he blocks the punch, and he hits. And then all of a sudden, guess what? Then he goes into the, the rope, and then he kicks the giant. And the giant falls down. And then he picks him up at Madison Square Garden. Some of you are like, well, how does wrestling have to do with Scripture? Where are you going to find out in a second? And he picks him up, and he body slams him. And by the way, Hulk Hogan wouldn't have picked Andre the Giant up if Andre the Giant hadn't let him pick him up. That's just a side note. And then guess what? He goes back to the rope. I just so want to do this, Mike. I wish you'd just come up here. <laughs> and, and he went back, and he drops the leg drop. Then he goes, and he drops the elbow. And he gets the one, come on, two. And he goes out victorious. Here's the deal. You got some giants in your life that's causing you not to have peace. And you get shot after shot, punch after punch, push after push, and it's taking your peace. But you got to rely on God, and you got to stop and you got to hawk up, and you got to go back to the center. you got to go back to the Word of God, and you got to say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. you got to stop and say, I'm an overcomer. I can make it. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm first and not last. Amen? Because you're going to have troubles. You're going to have people that want to knock the snot out of you. You're going to have things in your life that's going to overcome you. But guess what? you got to stop and say, guess what? Peace is not the absence of conflict. I mean, I think the Apostle Paul, I love the Apostle Paul. i got to slow down for a second. I said I was going to be calm. <laughs> but listen, the Apostle Paul is in a, in, a, in a jail cell in Philippi. And you know what? He says, you know what? Even though I'm I'm in jail at Philippi. I can remain confident. I can be gracious. And he shared while he was in the Philip, uh, uh, Philip, Philippi jail cell in the book of Philippians, he shared with a jailer, a Roman jailer. He could have been down, all, down and out. He said, this place is cold. This place got rats. The food's not very good. But he still had the joy of the Lord as his strength that gave him peace. Notice these things all work together. The fruit of the Spirit is love. If you have love, you can have joy. And if you have joy, you can have peace in the middle of those situations that we're talking about. And he shared with a Roman jailer there in the Philippi jail. And the Roman jailer knows a whole family got saved. 
God worked in all things. Do you hear what I'm saying? I want to give you four things this morning about peace, and then we can go eat some fried chicken. And the church said, amen. <laughs> Number one, <clears throat> peace is supernatural. Peace is supernatural. I want to turn your attention to John chapter 14, verse 27. <clears throat> Jesus said, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Notice, who's the peace giver? Jesus. And Jesus' peace is supernatural because it's different than the world's peace. See, the world's peace says that if you want to have peace in the world, you got to drink up, you got to pop, pop up, or you got to do all these other things that will give you peace. Well, guess what? All those other things, if the, listen, if the world tells you something gives you peace, you need to run because the world is wrong. There's only one thing that will give you peace, and Jesus said it. Jesus said, I will give you peace. He said, I'll give you peace, not as the world gives, but I will give you. You know why Jesus can give peace? Because he's the Lord of the peace. And because Jesus is the Prince of Peace, right? He said, I give you peace, not as the world gives. Listen, the vision of peace that the world gives, or, or that, that Jesus gives, is not an absence of conflict, but the vision of peace that Jesus gives is that you and I can have peace in the middle of conflict. Think about that conflict you're going through right now, or that conflict that you, that storm that you had a couple weeks ago. How did you handle that thing? Because if you got peace, it do, listen, it doesn't mean we can't say, man, man, I'm struggling with something. Man, there's something that's just wrecked my life, or there's something that's wrecked my family, or there's something that's just wrecked my, my world. But you're going to stop, and you're going to say, hey, I'm, I'm in the middle of the crisis. Oh, I just came up with this. This is good. I just, glory, hallelujah. In the middle of the crisis, you're not going to focus on your care, but in the middle of the crisis, you're going to focus on Christ. you got to focus on Christ in the middle of the crisis because he's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that can rescue you. There's a day coming. All the world and all the world wars and all the fighting and all that stuff's going to cease. But the absence of that conflict alone is not peace. I want you to think about something because this is kind of weird. It's a kind of a weird illustration, but I want to share it with you anyway. If you look at a graveyard, there's no conflict there. Actually, there's not much going on there at all. <laughs> he said everybody's dying to get in. That's what he said. That's a good one. But what do they say on the gravestones? Rest in peace. I question that because are they really resting in peace because there's nobody there? <laughs> Would you think about that? But listen, the biblical picture of peace is more like a garden than a graveyard. It's a place where there's life, there's life that's flourishing, where there's overflowing blessings, where there's fruitfulness. Now listen, you can have that in a garden and can still have a construction site around it. Did, would you just think about that? You could, did you even know that even in the middle of construction sites and in the middle of places that's been destroyed in previous world wars with bombs and things like that, you can go to some of these places today and in the middle of that chaos and in the middle of that destruction, there has been life that has grown up in the middle of that chaos. We live all around chaos, all around destruction and all around hard times, but God can say, I can still bring you peace and I can still grow you up in the middle of those things. And God can make something beautiful out of it. Listen, peace is not the subtraction of problems from your life, but peace is having those problems in addition to your life and still being okay and still flourishing. It's a supernatural thing. I wrote this down in my notes. But Christians in the middle of your storm, if you're a Christian today, this is for you. If you're not a Christian in this room, if you're not a believer in this room, this can be for you. But Christians can be calm as a cucumber in the middle of the storm because peace is supernatural. I remember 
over 12 or so years ago, 13 years ago, when my dad passed away. Before my dad died, he said, one of the last times I was actually up at, at the house before he passed away, he had asked me, he said, I want you to preach my funeral. I said, no, we're not talking about that right now. Because I was thinking my dad's Superman, he's never going to die, right? But I wasn't having that conversation with him. And then the week he gets put on hospice, I go up there, fly in on a Sunday, left church actually after men's prayer because I got a call that he wasn't doing good. And I go up there, and he lives a week on hospice. I leave on a Friday night to come back to Oklahoma. He passed away on Monday, and then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I got to preach my dad's funeral. And I go preach my dad's funeral. His funeral is on a Saturday. And I get up in the morning at 3 a.m. in the morning, and I go downstairs to the basement of the house I grew up in. I turned on my father's computer. And I sit down at my father's computer at his desk in his chair and write his funeral. And I finish, and then I, you know, it's, I'm, st I'm up all morning pretty much, and then I, then I, then I go preach the funeral at the, at the funeral home. And I have my friends that were coming to support me. And they're like, I don't know how you did that. And I said, I didn't. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a supernatural peace. And then the, 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 we go to, out to Cracker Barrel with the family and friends. And, then, and I go home and I just go home to my parents' house and I just crash. I was done. But there is something about that peace of God that comes over. I remember, you know, when I first got sick last year, and you guys know that story. The first week back after I came, I was gone, what, four weeks or something like that. I was gone, gone a while. And I came up to preach, and I didn't feel like even walking in this door. And God said, I will honor effort. And there was something that came over me when I was sitting in this chair up here and I was preaching. It began, it, it, it's supernatural. You can't explain it. It's the power of the supernatural. Let me give you number two. I could hang on that one for a while, but let me move on. Number two, not only is peace supernatural, but peace comes when your mind is right. Write that down. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Listen, in the middle of the storms, you need to keep your mind stayed on Christ. I remember I was on a plane one time flying, and uh, you always hear those stories about, you know, people getting saved on the planes. <laughs> Because you got a captive audience. And I was on this plane one time. And the turbulence was God awful. Like, and it was one of those like three seaters across. And I'm six foot two, and I'm like hitting my head. <laughs> like I'm by the window, I'm like, poof, poof, poof. and I'm just like, hey, that's okay. If 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 this thing crashes, I know where I'm going. And there's somebody like right, ne right next to me. They're freaking out. They're trying to get the, the stewardess like, can I get another shot of whatever? I need to. And I said, what are you doing? They're like, I can calm myself down. I'm like, I can calm you down. Can, 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 can I tell you, when you're on a plane, you know, people want to talk to you when you're on a plane. So, so sometimes people, they don't want to know that, that you're a pastor. Because somebody's like, well, what do you do? If you say I'm a pastor... They're immediately shut you down. Unless there's turbulence. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, like, why aren't you freaking out? I'm like, if I die, I'm going to heaven. It's okay. But I got to go preach at this church, so God's not going to crash this plane. Like, oh, he's not. I said, no, you don't need that. I know where I'm going. You got to be in your right mind. You ever, heard, you ever heard the saying that good things will happen? Like, you got to get your mind right. Like, from an athletics perspective, like, if you go in there into a, into, a, into a game and you think that you're already beat, you're done. Right? But if you go in there 
and you know that you prepared and you've done the best you can and you worked hard, yeah, you might still lose. But you're going to play a lot better game. Are you with me this morning? And so we have to go, listen, I, I'm going to tell you this. Can I tell you where the most spiritual battles, I, I, got a, I got some profound thoughts for you right now. Can I tell you where the most spiritual battles take place in our lives? Between these. You're like, what are you talking about? Between your ears. There, there's a book that if you haven't read it, you need to get it. It's by Joyce Meyer. It talks about the battlefield of the mind. Listen, the wars don't take place between me and Danny or me and Jonathan. A lot of my battles take place right between these. And I don't have time to go into this with you this morning. And I'm still wrestling with this too, but some theologians, you know, there's this, there's this theological discussion about the battle of Armageddon. You know, like, is it a literal war that's going to take place and where it is and all this stuff? Some theologians will say that, that the actual battle of Armageddon is the spiritual warfare that goes on in your mind. Because if Satan can confuse you, and if Satan can plant seeds of doubt and sow seeds of unpeacefulness, then Satan already has you. See, some of y'all can't even listen to this sermon right now because you're worried about what you're going to do when you get home. You're worried about that laundry that you got to do. I, okay, I just reminded some of y'all of laundry. Yeah, you're welcome. And we can't focus... We can't even get our mind right in the house of the Lord because we're so focused on other stuff. And if Satan can confuse you and cause you to focus on other stuff, then he already has you and he's going he's gonna to cut you off and choke you off from hearing the word that God has for you. Can, can I just speak to you? If, if this week you're thinking, I'm just too busy, then guess what? Then you're too busy. Did you get that? If you're too busy, you're too busy. You need to cut something out of your life and replace it with the peace of God. Your soul is made up of your mind and your will and your emotions. And you can only, your soul can only be prosperous and refreshed. Though that mind, that will, that emotions can only be properly refreshed if you focus your mind on the right things. Are you with me? So it's supernatural. Peace comes when your mind is right. Let me, this is an easy one. Number three, peace. That's yours and my responsibility. Ephesians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with request thank, and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what happens? And the peace of God, which I think you quoted this a few minutes ago, Brother Dan, sur surpasses all human understanding, will guard you and keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Look what happens there. If you want the peace of God to surpass, which surpasses all human understanding to be a part of your life, what's your part in it? Your part is, number one, don't be anxious. Well, Pastor, I can't, well, I can't help but be an anxious. Well, stop it. We need to have people in our life, Brother Mike, that, that when we get, we just stop it. Slow down. I think that was like on a show. You said, somebody gets crazy. Stop it. Somebody comes up in here and says, oh, oh, I got this going. Oh, I got that going. Stop. Sometimes to our spouses, we say, stop. Sometimes to our kids, stop. Our kids are fussing and fighting and, and creating conflict and craziness in the house. Stop it. Here's the problem with parenting today. We're sitting over, now little buddy, I just need you to stop it over there. I just need you to stop fussing with your brother and stop fussing with your sister. I'm, don't make me come over there. The Bible says, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. 
And we got to be able to, especially men, you need to take the leadership role in your house and you need to stand up and say, stop it. Because I am the head of this house and we're not going to act like that. Some of your wives, men, will respect you more if you would get up there and tell your kids, you're not going to talk to your mama like that. You're not going to talk to my wife like that. Oh, we don't like this. <laughs> we need to take the spiritual role in our home because peace is our responsibility. Got people come to me and say, oh, I'm, my life is just chaotic and my life is just conflicted. Well, when's the last time you took responsibility and you got into the Word of God? Well, I just don't have time for that. You, have to, you don't have time for anything else. But the word of God, are you with me? It's our responsibility. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, or blessed are those that maintain the peace, for they shall be sons of God. Listen to me. The scripture's saying, not saying you're blessed when you're right. It's not saying you're going to be blessed when you have the last word. It's not going to say you're blessed when you win every argument. It says you're blessed when you maintain the peace. You are blessed when you don't walk in the pathway of strife. You're blessed when you don't have to have your way. You're blessed when you're willing to keep the peace. The word peacemaker, it means a diplomat, an arbitrator, a mediator, a calmer, soother, go-between. It reads more like the characteristics of Jesus, doesn't it? Because it's an attitude that Jesus walked in on this earth. That he said, I'm going to maintain the peace from a spiritual perspective. And you say, well, pastor, didn't he turn over the tables? Yes, there's a, there's a time and a place for that. You know why Jesus turned over the tables? Because he was trying to keep peace in the temple. Because they had turned the tabernacle and t- t- the temple courts into a place of chaos. And they were ripping people off. So Jesus, what was he doing in the middle of that? He was restoring the peace of God. Peace is our responsibility. Peace is your responsibility. Let me give this last one. I told you I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not preaching long today. Peace comes. I love this word. I just had to use this word. Peace comes from proximity to Jesus. What do I mean by that? Peace comes from closeness to Jesus. There's a story, and, and I'm not going to have you turn there. You can read it when you get home. Matthew 4, 35 through 41. Jesus' disciples were caught in the middle of this tumultuous and treacherous storm and they were going to the other side of the sea of galilee and jesus is on the boat with them and the bible says and i preached a sermon on this a long time ago but it says that 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 jesus was on asleep on the boat with his head on a pillow and you know what the disciples are doing jesus is in the bottom of the boat just sleeping in the middle of the storm and the disciples are like oh we're like freaking out. The boat is rocking. You ever watch the show, um, like the deadliest catch and all that stuff? You know, they show some of those, the, the swells on, 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 the, on the ocean. Man, and those swells just come over the top of those big old boats and the boats are rocking. I can just imagine the disciples be like, he really took us out here for all this? He said, follow me. And I thought it was going to be good. I thought we were going to have donkeys with padded humps and but now i'm on a i'm on a boat and we're all gonna die i just some of y'all just didn't even get the padded hump part thing come to me after service and i'm gonna explain it to you but they thought everything was gonna be good okay let me let me back up listen they thought everything was gonna be easy following jesus is not always easy As a matter of fact, following Jesus is always most definitely the opposite of easy. And guess what? If it would be easy, everybody would be doing it. But it's not easy. And they were in the middle of a storm just like some of you are in the middle of storms today. And you feel like Jesus is falling asleep. You you, you don't even know if Jesus, listen to me, is in your boat. What do you think about that? You said, Jesus, I can't feel you. Jesus, I can't hear you. Jesus, I don't know what's going on. But guess what? The, in that story, the Bible says that, that they called on Jesus. Here's my question. Have you called on Jesus? And the Bible says that Jesus gets up and he walks to the, I'm just going to say the front of the boat because I don't know the nautical terms. 
And Jesus says a simple phrase. Peace. Be still. And at the subject of the master's voice, the wind began to be subject to the master. Because Jesus is the master of the wind. One of our, one of our singers in here, I don't care who it is, I, I, I want y'all to get that song ready. Not for today. We should have done it for today. But the song says, I know the master of the wind. I know the maker of the rain. If he can calm the storm, make the sun to shine again. I know the master of the wind. And at the minute he said, peace be still. You know why the storm stopped for the disciples? Because they got close to Jesus. Instead of standing on the, see, what, what, see, we got Jesus in our boat and Jesus is right over there, but we want to choose to stand over here and be like, I just wish he'd do something. I just, I just wish Jesus would move. Like, like, doesn't Jesus know what I, doesn't Jesus know that like, I'm an, I'm a musicianist in his church. Like, doesn't Jesus know that I serve breakfast? Oh, oh, I taught Sunday school for 42 and a half years. So? When's the last time you got out of the kitchen or off the platform or out of the Sunday school class and you came to the altar and you came and got a hold of Jesus and said, Jesus, I can't do it unless you step in. I've been serving. I've been growing. I've been being a part of the church. But now I feel far from you. Jesus, I need help. Because we don't want to humble ourselves. We want to cry about it and complain about it and just tell Jesus all the stuff that we've done when Jesus wants us to come to him and say, Jesus, I need help. I can't do this by myself. And, and, and for some of us in this room tonight, or this, this morning, sorry, I'm thinking about holding a Sunday night revival tonight. <laughs> Your stuff is not going to get fixed until you get close to Jesus. Jesus just can't be a once a month thing. Jesus can't do it. Peace comes from proximity to Jesus. Let me share this final illustration. A man visited his doctor for an examination. The doctor said, what's the trouble? The patient answers, doctor, I've got troubles everywhere. I look, I've got troubles in my business, troubles at home, troubles everywhere, and I'm just plain run down. The physician, when he was done, said, you're not run down, just the opposite, you're wound up. And the, and, the, and the man said, doctor, well, give me something to slow me down. What do you want? Asked the doctor. And the man said, give me a tranquilizer. Give me a pill. Give me something. And so the doctor sat down and he wrote out a prescription. The man took the prescription and he goes home. And finally, he, when he gets home, he pulls it out. After going to the drugstore, the pharmacist looked at the prescription and said, man, I'm sorry, I can't fill this prescription. What do you mean? The man said to the pharmacist. This is a drugstore, isn't it? You're a pharmacist, aren't you? This is a doctor's prescription, so why can't you fill it? The pharmacist answered, I'm sorry, sir, but we don't stock this in our store. Because if you want this prescription filled, you've got to go home and get out your Bible. The man looked at the prescription from the doctor for the very first time, and it says, take three doses of Romans 5.1 every day. And he went home and he read the, the scripture, and Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He calls a doctor and he says, what did you do? Uh, this is the prescription I wanted. I thought you were going to be in pill. I thought you were going to give me something to, to drink, something to slow me down, something to make me go to sleep. He said, no, you're not going to have peace in your life until you make Jesus the Lord of your life. Amen. And that's something that we, listen to me, that, that's a term we don't like in the church. Because it's easy to accept Jesus because he died on the cross and he, he died for our sins. But Jesus, Jesus does, listen to me, Jesus just doesn't want to be your Savior. But He wants to be the Lord of your life. In other words, He wants to be the Master of your life. Listen to me, He wants us to bow down and worship Him. Not serve Him, worship Him. 
And I'll just be honest, there's some things in my life that I like to control. I am a type A personality. I'm Irish. And I just want to control it all. And because I try to control it all, I end up controlling nothing at all. Are you with me? And then I get crazy and I have no peace. You know, one of the things in this church, you know, a lot of pastors, and there's, I struggle with this sometimes, but there's, listen, there's a lot of pastors, there's day, they're afternoon, you know, their afternoon, whether it's good or bad, is going to be predicated, I'm just going to say it, by how many butts are in the pews. Or by how good a sermon he or she thought they preached. Can I tell you, this isn't Gary's church. This is Christ's church. Amen? And, 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 and Jesus don't need me here. It's his church. I'm just thankful to be here. <laughs> thankful to be able to be serving in God's church. Now, some of y'all, when I say God's church, this is the only church that God loves. Please understand. <laughs> you know. But listen to me. We got to get close to Jesus. As you stand this morning.